Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this, the third meeting of the sixth session of the Scottish Parliament of the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee. Uh, we're going to have two items on the agenda today. For the first time, consideration of continued petitions uh, from the previous Parliament, and then a consideration of new petitions. And we will be joined by a number of parliamentary colleagues who have an interest in some of the petitions that we are considering as we go forward. So our first item on the agenda is the consideration of uh, continued position, uh, petitions, uh, all of which we have 10, all of which are being carried forward from the last session of Parliament. Firstly, PE uh, 1517, polypropylene mesh medical devices, uh, a petition I've had some engagement with myself. This is the first continued petition today. Uh, it's has been lodged by Elaine Holmes, uh, who I should say is a constituent of mine, and Olive McElroy on behalf of Scottish Mesh survivors. Hear our voice campaign. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to suspend the use of polypropylene transvaginal mesh procedures, to initiate a public inquiry and or comprehensive independent research to evaluate the safety of mesh devices using all evidence available, including that from across the world to introduce mandatory reporting of all, adver all adverse incidents by health professionals, to set up a trans Scottish transvaginal mesh implant register with view to linking this up with national and international registers, to introduce fully informed consent with uniformity throughout Scotland's health boards, and to write to the MHRA and ask that they reclassify uh, transvaginal mesh as devices to heighten alert status to reflect ongoing concerns worldwide. Uh, our meeting papers outline some of the many actions that uh, the committee has taken since this, first petition, this petition was first lodged in April 2014. This includes a report, a chamber debate, as well as several evidence sessions. And in these sessions, the committee has heard directly from witnesses, including, among others, two cabinet secretaries for health, chief medical officers of the day, as well as key figures in the medicines and healthcare product regulatory and agency, uh, Dr. Dionysius Veronicus, a surgeon specialising in pelvic mesh removal in the United States, uh, and so memorably, of course, from the petitioners themselves. Our papers also highlight the recent introduction by the Scottish Government of the Transvaginal Mesh Removal Cost Reimbursement Scotland Bill, uh, part of the Government's programme announced yesterday. The bill will allow the Scottish Government to set up a scheme which could reimburse people who have paid private healthcare costs to have their transvaginal mesh implant removed. And it could also cover travel costs and hotel accommodation paid in relation to the surgery. In their most recent submission, the petitioners state that they are heartened. The Scottish Government's Women's Health Plan for 2021-24 highlights the importance of learning from the mesh crisis. And they do also highlight some questions that they have regarding the treatment women suffering with mesh complications can access. Uh, and with that, I wonder if colleagues would like to come in. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Um, this is over seven years now this petition has been running session four, um, where I was there at the beginning, session five, I've seen it through, and now in session six. Um, we've taken over 100 um, written submissions, several oral, oral submissions, and we've had debates, as you says, in Parliament, and lots of questions about this issue. Um, and I'd like to put on record two petitioners and all the women who have turned up to say a big thank you to him. Um, it's probably some of the most emotional evidence I have ever had to take in my time sitting on any committee. Um, so to them, um, for the perse perseverance, I would like to say thank you very much, because we've got a result for this. It's maybe taken a lot of years and a, a lot longer time than the petitioners would have liked, but finally we have got a result. So I'd like to say thank you to them um, and everybody who has supported them. And I would like to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders. Okay, any other colleagues like to come in on this petition? I, I'd just like to Tess say, White. Uh, hello. Um, I, I'd just like to say that there's now hope that the progression of the bill can be the final chapter of the horrific trauma. And there are still a number of outstanding <coughs> questions, but I'd just also like to pay tribute to your work, Jackson, on the mesh implants. So. Well, well thank you for that. And I'd like to say to... Many of the women who may be watching this morning, a huge thank you for everything that you've done, really, over seven years, a third of the lifetime of our own parliament, uh, pursuing this extraordinary health injustice. And to our former colleagues, 
uh, Alec Neil, Neil Finlay, and also Joanne Lamont, who is the convener of this petitions committee, did terrific work in the last parliament. I think it's been one of the most significant uh, petitions that this parliament has progressed. It's had implications and ramifications that have been watched and felt in countries across the world. And all of it was down to uh, the original petition led by two women, as I said, Elaine Holmes, constituent of mine, and Olive McElroy, but so many other women as well. And in closing this petition, uh, I think there are one or two questions we might still ask, but in closing this petition, I'd actually like to take the unprecedented step of inviting uh, all colleagues on the committee to give these women a round of applause, because I think what they have done has been quite remarkable. Thank you. And I think we have formally closed that petition. Uh, we're joined by Emma Harper and Eleanor Whittam, MSPs, uh, this morning for our second petition, PE161, the upgrade of the A75, uh, PE1657, the upgrade of the A77. And we've heard from other colleagues as well, but we'll be coming to them shortly. Uh, this petition um, by Matt Halliday and Donald McCarry, respectively, calls on the Scottish Government to upgrade the A75 Euroroute to dual carriageway for its entirety as soon as possible, and 1657 calls on the Scottish Government to dual the A77 from Ayr Whitlet's roundabout south to the two ferry ports located at Cairn Ryan, including the point at which the A77 connects with the A75. And as I said a moment ago, we have Emma Harper and uh, Elena Whittam with us this morning as well. During its consideration of the petitions, the Public Petitions Committee took evidence from the Minister for Transport and the Islands in 2017 and received 31 written submissions. Our meeting papers summarise a number of written submissions, including the submission from the then Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, which was raised at the last consideration of the petitions. The written submission detailed investments made into the A77 and the A75, the second strategic Scottish transport uh, review, projects review in the Dumfries and Galloway area, and the parallel study which engaged with stakeholders and considered the rationale for improvements to transport in South West Scotland. The UK Government has already committed £20 million to developing projects identified in Sir Peter Hendy's Union Connectivity Review interim report, including upgrading the A75 between Gretna and Stranraer. In their most recent submission, Donald McHarry, the petitioner for 1657, points to research conducted for the Strategic Transport Projects Review, which highlighted that the current A77 is behind the current required standard. The submission notes that in the week commencing Tuesday the 24th of August, there were two fatalities and two casualties between the A77 and A714 diversionary route, causing the southwest corner of Scotland to be completely cut off to traffic uh, to the north. The petition is calling for the committee to hold a round table in Stranraer, as discussed by the Session 5 committee, in order for members to hear firsthand about issues raised in this petition. Uh, Finlay Carson, MSP, hoped to be able to attend. However, he's currently convening another parliamentary committee, and he therefore sent the following. I have been a long-term advocate for improvements to both the A75 and the A77, and I have given evidence at the committee on numerous occasions, stressing the need for action and not further delay. The conveners group met the First Minister on the 13th of November 2019. The First Minister said that she would respond to the petition in writing, and that she would use PE1610 as a case study to describe the process that the government goes through to reach decisions. Despite repeated requests for information from the committee, no response, as far as I am aware, has been received. So I am quoting from Fidley Carson here, uh, submission. And secondly, in the light of current continuous problems, particularly on the A77 at Carlock Wall, I would like the committee to consider a stakeholder meeting as previously suggested. It should include the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport and the Transport Minister. Um, that is the introduction, and I think, if I may, I will now come to our two colleagues who might want to... Uh, add to our deliberations before we consider what steps to take next. And I'm, I'm looking to the two of you, and I, I will go to Emma Harper first. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you for um, having us attend today. This is a, a really important petition. Uh, like my colleague, uh, Finlay Carson, I have had 
numerous questions in chamber. We've had three debates in the last five years in the previous session. This has great interest for people in the southwest of Scotland. The A75 and A77 are main arterial routes for uh, connecting us to the European Union, and I absolutely agree that they need to be improved. And so I'm interested today in how we are going to move forward this petition, um, because I'm aware of the South West uh, Roads Review that is feeding into the Strategic Transport Review as well, which is imminently due for release, and I'm keen to see what improvements the government will be committing to. Um, we've also had Michael Matheson when he was Cabinet Secretary in Stranraer meeting both members of the A75 and the A77 action groups and uh, we were able to hear from him early in the when Michael Matheson was made Transport Secretary but I am aware that uh, some of the challenges that we've been doing freedom of information requests around is safety, collisions, fatalities and trying to use that kind of argument and evidence for investing in these roads. Um, we know how many lorries are on these roads and um, when ferries arrive and when they depart. So it's really, um, I, I guess for me, I'm just really keen to see that whatever the Petitions Committee can do to chivy along the government to make action um, and uh, make improvements on both roads. So thank, thank you. you for that. May I ask you if you have a view on the uh, um, suggestion made in session five of a roundtable discussion? Uh, I, there has been, um, I know that the Cabinet Secretary for Transport had met petitioners here in Parliament and then as well at Stranraer. The Stranraer meeting was one that I organised and all colleagues were invited to that as well because I wanted to be clear that this isn't a political issue, it's an issue of safety and transport and access. So if the Strategic Roads Review publication is imminent, it would be probably worthwhile hearing that first rather than um, another roundtable meeting. I know how concerned the Transport uh, Minister is right now, and he knows that there is a, a high level of concern from people in the southwest of Scotland. OK, thank you. Um, and welcome to Eleanor Whitton. By definition, I imagine this is your first engagement with the Public <laughs> Petitions uh, Committee, but uh, welcome, and uh, I invite you to add your thoughts on the petition. Good morning, everyone, and um, thank you, Convener, for giving me the opportunity to address the committee this morning. As the very new MSP um, for Carrick, Cumnock and Doon Valley, it was very imperative that I speak today in support of the petition's desire to see significant improvements to the A77, as the majority of the single lane section of this route lies within my constituency boundaries. I travel the route often, and I know firsthand of the frustrations that can be felt when stuck behind a platoon convoy of HGVs, or when scheduled roads um, repairs or serious accidents cause delays and lengthy diversions via rural road infrastructure, which in some cases results in the absolute agony and heartbreak of another fatality being reported. And sadly, as the conveners mentioned, in recent weeks we've lost yet more lives on this stretch of road, and I extend my heartfelt condolences to the families involved. I understand also fully that the geography of the stretch south of Ayr is very, very challenging as it is very beautiful. At places it hugs the coast and offers the most spectacular views, but at times these stretches offer the most frustration too, as driver impatience causes rash decisions, sometimes with serious consequences. Several years ago, I experienced a near crash whilst travelling the route to my caravan with my then five-year-old son in the car. A driver, frustrated by a slow-moving lorry, decided to overtake, and I found myself hurtling head-on um, at a, a, a vehicle at speed. Thankfully, the driver managed to nip back in in front of the HDV, and I kept control of the car. Um, but 17 years later, I can still recall the feelings of helplessness and terror um, at the time. Like the folk of Maybole, I'm delighted to see the progress of their much sought after and anticipated bypass. And I just know how many benefits they're going to see from this huge infrastructure investment. Currently, large HGVs crawl through the town mere feet from pedestrians and buildings, making it difficult for residents or visitors to enjoy the historic town. The bypass has enabled a multi-million pound town centre regeneration project to kick off. And I know that along with greatly improved air quality, 
which is massively important. The town will see a renaissance of town centre vibrancy. Like so many other small towns and villages from Minishant to Kirkoswald and from Garvin to Ballantrae, they also see their daily lives impacted by the high volumes of HD traffic en route to the port of Cairn Ryan. And it's imperative that improvements are made that mean tourism, trade, commerce are continued unimpeded, but local lives are protected and communities nurtured. I understand fully that we need to await for the publication of the STPR2 recommendations, and it is my hope that we'll, we shall see significant investment in the South West that is long anticipated and much needed. All options need to be on the table, including moving freight onto rail and off the roads, duelling, bypasses, additional crawler lanes. In this new Brexit era, the A77 and the A75 are the gateway routes to the EU, and we cannot underestimate their importance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, would anybody like to uh, make any contribution? As we, I mean, I think in the first instance, there's an argument certainly for this petition remaining open. Uh, and it's a case in keeping it open of just considering what further actions we might take. Uh, Tess White? I, I, I'd just like to um, say that we've had four MSPs. We've got Emma Harper, Eleanor Whittam, uh, Finley Carson and Sharon Dowie, four MSPs who talk about, as Eleanor said, you, um, sorry, Emma said, safety, transport and access. So, and it, it is disappointing that we've not seen progress despite numerous requests. So I think progress does need to be made on this. Okay, any suggestions? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Like yourself, I think we should keep the petition open, but I think we should write to Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport seeking an update on the progress of the Strategic Transport Projects Review 2 and request an indication as to when Phase 2 outcomes will be announced. Um, we could also write and ask him about his views on the UK Government upgrading the road. Um, as for the round table, I think I would like to wait until we get these written submissions back to see if we should go ahead and hold the round table. Yeah, was that, I mean, I was struck by Emma Harper's uh, advocacy of um, holding off the round table until we see a little bit more about where things go, but reserve the right uh, still to come back to that. And I think we take forward. I think we just it's clear we're writing to the UK government about the A75 um, yeah. uh, route. But are the committee colleagues agreed on that? Paul's. Paul Sweeney. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'm generally supportive of the idea of dueling of the national trunk road network for safety reasons. I think there are second, you know, there's a some sometimes it's conflated with um, environmental concerns, but actually the safety implications of dueling on trunk roads is critical. Um, a, a wider issue that I'd, is, is a point that um, Elena raised um, about the issue of rail substitution. Um, a wider assessment of the condition of being able to move uh, freight from the ports at Cairn Ryan and Stranraer onto rail uh, is worthy of consideration. I also think something that's lacking, certainly on the West Coast, is a, is a port strategy generally. Um, and I think there needs to be a consideration about the utilisation of some of the Firth of Clyde ports further north, such as at um, Greenock, for moving freight onto the motorway network. Um, which would help to relieve, relieve pressure on the Ayrshire Trunk Road network. So I think all of these things are considered in isolation. So perhaps it might be worth writing to the relevant ministers to ask for that to be brought into the consideration of the strategy, particularly in STP, STP, T, STPR, sorry, the strategic, trans, sorry, strategic Transport Review. Or, uh, so I think that we really need to look at that in a wider sense, because there really isn't a consideration about ports infrastructure in the west of Scotland and how that's managed. Um, it's effectively a free market, um, but that has significant public costs that are not properly accounted for. OK, thank you. I mean, that, it's probably straying slightly beyond the, the parameters of the petition itself, but I can see the relevance to it, notwithstanding. I'm not sure from the... I mean, obviously, we are coming to this as a new committee. It is a continuing petition. I don't know whether these issues were previously explored or whether Mr Sweeney's identified some issues there that we could actually just seek some further opinion on from the Scottish Government, which we can do. That, thank you for that. And I should just clarify that it's to the Scottish Government we're asking for a view on the UK Government's proposals in relation to the 75, not to the UK Government itself. Um, are we happy with that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move then to petition 1662,
improve treatment for patients with Lyme disease and associated tick-borne diseases. Uh, the next con uh, this was lodged by uh, Janie Kringian and Lorraine Murray on behalf of Tick-Borne Illness Campaign Scotland. And the petition calls on the Scottish Government to improve testing and treatment for Lyme disease and associated tick-borne diseases by ensuring that medical professionals in Scotland are fully equipped to deal with the complexity of tick-borne infections, addressing the lack of reliability of tests, the full variety of species in Scotland, the presence of persister bacteria, which are difficult to eradicate, and the complexities caused by the presence of possibly multiple co-infections, and to complement this with a public awareness campaign. At the last consideration of this petition in February 2021, the Session 5 Committee took evidence from the then Minister for Public Health and Sport, Marie Goujon, supported by Scottish Government officials Dr Jill Hawkins, Senior Medical Officer Health Protection and Public Health, and Professor Tom Evans, CMO Speciality Advisor in Infectious Diseases. During the session, the Minister stated that the Scottish Government is committed to supporting people with Lyme disease, finding new and better diagnostic and treatment tools, and trying to prevent it in the first place. It was revealed that the Scottish Government would soon be holding a roundtable event which would bring together clinicians, patient representatives and public health experts to discuss testing, treatment and raising awareness. The Minister confirmed that the Scottish Government is keen to develop an infectious diseases managed clinical network to include Lyme disease in its work stream. The Minister and officials also agreed that more research is needed to underpin the development of better treatment options, particularly for people who are suffering with longer term symptoms. Again, uh, in discussing this petition, I ask colleagues whether they have any comments or suggestions they would like to make. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Somebody in Session 5 who was there when the evidence was given, I would like to ask the Scottish Government what the outcomes of a round table event were um, and where they are in establishing an infectious diseases um, manual clinical network and what they have done to promote a public campaign about it and the effects of the long term um, of Lyme's disease on people and what they have done to um, look into more research for it. Thank you. So, I mean, can I ask the class, do we know did the roundtable event take place? We don't, we don't actually know right. that. So I think we want to confirm if it has taken place and then I think sensibly establish any outcomes from it. Uh, anybody else like to comment on this petition? Tess White. I, I would like to support my colleague, um, Mr Torrance, and say we do need more research on this. OK, thank you. And that meets with the general agreement of the committee. Mr Sweeney? Uh, certainly, I've, I've, uh, this has been raised in debates um, in, in uh, other parliaments um, in relation to particularly ME, as a potential Lyme disease as a contributory factor to long-term chronic illness, um, which is defined as ME. Um, it might be of interest to understand more about the interactions of research on that, because um, I think that's another condition that people often feel it is not properly taken seriously by the medical profession. Um, so it might be something worth considering as part of this petition. OK, thank you. I mean, I, we did have a members debate on this in session five, led by uh, Alexander Burnett um, from memory. Uh, but yes, fine, thank you. Okay, we're clear. All right, anybody else, any comment? Thank you. Um, we now move on to PE 1723, Essential Tremor Treatment in Scotland. And we are joined this morning by uh, Rhoda Grant, MSP. Good morning to you. Uh, this is a petition lodged by Mary Ramsey. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to raise awareness of essential tremor and to support the introduction and use of a focus ultrasound scanner for treating people in Scotland who have this condition. The Session 5 Public Petitions Committee last considered this petition at its meeting on the 10th of March 2021. At that meeting, the committee agreed to continue the petition and include it in the legacy paper uh, for our, the, our, their Session 6 uh, colleagues, successors, us, along with a suggestion to seek an update from the Cabinet Secretary of Health and Sport on the Scottish Government's plans to make an application to the National Specialist Services Committee for an MRG FUS service. Magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound, which actually is easier to say than MRG FUS, is a relatively new treatment for essential tremor, which uses an MRI guide to powerful focus, powerful focus ultrasound to a small point in the body, causing an intense local heat, which can destroy tissue. Uh, 
The Scottish Government highlighted guidelines published by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, commonly known as NICE, in June 2018 on the use of unilateral MRI-guided focused ultrasound thalamotomy for treatment-resistant essential tremor. This concludes that while clinical evidence does not raise safety concerns, current evidence of efficacy is limited. Therefore, evidence of, of patient benefit is too limited for the NHS to currently adopt MRI-guided ultrasound technology for treatment of essential tremor. The Scottish Government notes that the National Specialist Services Committee met in December 2018 to consider a Stage 1 application for specialist treatment... Uh, lost my, for specialist treatment of patients with ET using magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound. The committee was unable to endorse the application for funding as a nationally designated service. It was highlighted that NICE guidance is permissive and whilst there is some evidence for use of magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound in essential tremor, there is a clear statement that research is needed into its application for Parkinson's disease and MS tremor. NSC was clear that should the evidence base be further developed and magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound be recognised as a safe and effective intervention for treatment of tremor, the committee would be willing to consider a reapplication in future. On the 16th of December 2020, th this committee took evidence from Professor Dipankar Nandi, consultant neurosurgeon and head of department Charing Cross Hospital and St Mary's Hospital and Professor Imperial College London. Our meeting paper summarised the evidence from that meeting. And in her submission, the petitioner advised that her tremors and the lack of understanding surrounded them has impacted on her entire life. The petitioner does not believe there is a need for further research and evidence into the effectiveness of magnetic resonance guided focused ultrasound before the Scottish Government backs it, noting this treatment for essential tremor is currently available on Medicare in the United States of America, the NHS in Japan and in other countries around Europe. When referencing the progress made by NHS England, the petitioner concludes that while she believes England is proceeding apace with providing this treatment, unfortunately Scotland is falling behind as the costs for bringing it to Scotland are simultaneously increasing. And before we turn to colleagues, I think I would like to invite Rhoda Grant to comment in support of the petition. Rhoda Grant. Thank, thank you, convener, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, this petition was obviously a previous petition to the committee, and some of the new members of the committee might not be totally aware. So th there are basically um, two treatments for essential tremor. An essential tremor is very disabling because it means that people shake so things that we all take for granted like drinking eating in public even speaking it can affect the way someone speaks so the people that suffer from it tend to become very isolated tend not to to mix socially so it's a very difficult illness to deal with and they tend also um to have very late diagnosis um Mary Ramsey, my constituent and the petitioner, um, wasn't diagnosed until her 40s and has had brain surgery to deal with this. Now, the difficulty with um, the brain surgery is it, can, it does work and it's a proven treatment, but you need to go back and, and move those electrodes. So um, people who have uh, brain surgery for essential tremor have a lifetime of procedures ahead of them, whereas a uh, focused ultrasound is non-invasive, so there is no um, there is no brain surgery involved, and is a one-off treatment. Now, just I suppose, and, and it's life-changing for those th those involved. It, it absolutely is. Now, it's an approved treatment in um, NHS England fund this, and people from Scotland can be referred. To NHS England for treatment, which to me is totally crazy because we have this machine in Dundee and could be treating people here and now in Scotland at a much lower cost. And so it has. The Dundee, what was the point about Dundee? I just missed that. When the peti this petition started, um, Dundee, um, NHS Tayside, and um, 
university in Dundee were working together um, to fund and purchase a machine. They have now done that. Um, they, the machine is available and is giving treatment here in Scotland, um, but only experimental treatment, and I say that in inverted commas because the treatment is not experimental, it's been approved elsewhere, but it's, it's under that locus that they can then treat people. A, a GP or consultant in Scotland cannot always, unless they're talking about experimental treatment, um, refer someone to Dundee. What they have to do is then refer someone to London to Professor Nandi and his colleagues. And um, there's a huge waiting list, as you can imagine, and it seems just wasteful that we have this treatment available in Scotland, but Scottish people can't really access it. Now, Mary um, was speaking to me recently, and she sent me a, a video, which I think we'll send on to Clarks, and hopefully they can send that round committee members, um, of Ian Sharp, who's received this treatment. And Mary also told me this morning that herself and Ian Sharp would be very willing to come to the petitions committee and give evidence of their experience of the two different treatments. And maybe people could, um, committee members could get a better um, idea of that. So I'm urging you not to close this petition. I think we've come a long, long way. And I think the previous petitions committee um, was instrumental in getting this moved up the the political agenda and probably um instrumental in getting this uh, this uh, technology into scotland but it's a waste if we can't actually use the technology for the good of patients in scotland so i would ask that you you pursue scottish government on this and uh, try and push that this uh, treatment in dundee becomes available to people in scotland but also urge you to, to hear from Mary and from Ian Sharp, who would give you a first-hand view of what this condition means to them and how life-changing the treatment can actually be. Thank you. May, may I just uh, ask, uh, in relation to Professor Nandy, uh, is, the, is that the only place in England where the treatment is offered? Is through Professor Nandy in, in London or are there other locations in addition? The, 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 there are two centres in in London, I understand, um, for the the um, invasive treatment. Is, uh, people in Scotland go to Glasgow or to Newcastle. So I'm not sure if Newcastle is looking to develop this as well, but they are certainly the centre that was used by a lot of Scottish patients for for the more invasive invasive treatment. Um, so it is it is London at the moment that people need to go for this treatment. Okay, thank you. That that was um, that was very interesting. A colleagues, anybody like to comment on this? Bill Kidd. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, and thanks to Rhoda Grant for uh, giving us that uh, really essential information. And what I was um, most taken with is the report. Um, about Dundee being available to actually provide this sort of service, um, but it's not being taken up. And it does seem like a great deal of um, discomfort with people uh, who have tremors and require treatment to have to travel all the way to London. And it also sounds as though it's a waste of money having to do all that when it's available in Dundee. Um, so I think that um, we should be in touch with the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport uh, to raise this issue, actually, and ask why that facility here in Scotland is not being used for Scottish patients. OK. Tess White? I think the very fact that there are over 4,000 people with essential tremors means that this does need looking at. It's very important for those 4,000 people. OK. Anybody else? No? Um, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, and... I, you know, I think we should write to the Cabinet Secretary to find out what stage they're at. Uh, I think we should very specifically draw attention to the fact you know, that the committee has been made aware of the Dundee facility. That may have ar arisen before, but nonetheless, the fact that the facility exists and therefore it's clearly down to the approvals process within the health service as to whether or not this treatment should be offered. And I think the fact that it is offered uh, elsewhere is... Um, a reasonably compelling uh, testimony in support of that. Um, I think I would like to hear, hear the response to that in the first instance, but I certainly don't rule out uh, hearing from the petitioners themselves because I know from um, 
the petition we started with today, whether it be MESH or petitions on uh, uh, other medical conditions, that that can actually very often give committee members a fairly uh, obviously unique insight into the condition itself, and it would be well worth potentially hearing from that. So are we agreed to take that in two stages and keep the petition open? David Torrance. Um, I was just looking at the submissions from the University of Dundee. I wonder if we could get an update from them, because the last time was um, 18th of December 2020 that they gave us an update, and they were hoping to have it all in installation and up and running by then. So I wonder if okay. we could write to them and ask for an update. That seems sensible as well. We could do that. So we'll keep the petition open. We'll write to the Cabinet Secretary. We'll write to the University of Dundee, and we'll reserve the right, uh, or reserve the option of, rather than the right, reserve the option to bring the petitioners before us, uh, depending on the progress that we subsequently make. We agree? Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, Rhoda Grant has got a season ticket this morning to, uh, <laughs> to the Petitions Committee and is joining us along with uh, Liam MacArthur, MSP, for Petition 1804, a Halt Highlands and Islands Airports Limited's Air Traffic Management Strategy, a petition lodged by... Alistair McKeegan, John Doig and Peter Henderson on behalf of the Benbecula Community Council. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to halt Highlands and Islands Airport Limited's air traffic management strategy project to conduct an independent assessment of the decisions and decision-making process of the ATMS project. The clerk's note summarises the actions taken in this petition during the previous session, including uh, quite extensive three oral evidence sessions with the petitioners, representatives of Highlands and Islands Air Traffic Management, and then the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity. Since the petition was last considered, we've received four submissions, two from HIAL, one from the Cabinet Secretary and one from the petitioner. And these have all been circulated within our meeting papers. And again, before coming to committee colleagues, I'll turn to our two uh, visiting MSP colleagues. And uh, since he's been waiting for his moment in the sun, I'll invite Liam MacArthur, uh, if you'd like to comment to the committee first. Thanks very much, uh, Convener, and thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in these discussions. Uh, can I also put on record um, my gratitude to your predecessor and predecessor committee um, for the work they've done on this? I, I think it was pretty forensic, as you've outlined. They did some fairly detailed work, including uh, a number of oral evidence sessions, and, and I think those were very helpful, not necessarily in getting to the sort of conclusion I was looking for, but certainly exposing, uh, I think, some of the, the fundamental issues uh, involved in this, uh, this whole project. I, I would urge the committee to, to, to keep this petition open. I, I think there has been a lack of um, willingness by, by high health management to accept um, uh, the deep, deep concerns there are in, across all of the communities really served by um, the, uh, the air traffic services that are um, to be centralised in, in Inverness. Um, that goes across the political, uh, the political spectrum um, and those um, that, who have no political affiliation at all. Uh, I think there's no question that modernisation of air traffic services is needed. Um, that's not contested at all. Uh, I think what is um, uh, what is fiercely contested is that um, the, uh, the the remote tower model is the only viable model um, that will achieve um, that modernisation, achieve um, the regulatory requirements that um, are, are are current and are coming down the track. Um, I, since the last committee took evidence, I think the most substantive development has been the publication of the island impact assessment that was uh, carried out, um, slightly delayed, but, but, but it was carried out. Um, certainly in the Orkney context, um, it identified no positive benefits, a, a range of negative and significant negative uh, um, impacts uh, of the centralisation uh, proposals. And therefore, I think there's a, f a feeling certainly within the community I represent that if the island's bill, the island's proofing uh, concept is to mean anything, um, simply setting aside the island impact assessment is just not a sustainable position. Uh, in questioning, um, in written questions, uh, ministers have confirmed they've had no uh, engagement with HIOS management uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the outcome of that uh, island impact assessment, which seems to me uh, wholly uh, unjustified and, uh, and unsatisfactory, and at the very least, 
uh, I would hope that the, that the committee might agree that, that that is something that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, I think the other point maybe to, to reinforce is that these proposals obviously predate uh, the pandemic predate um, what we've seen in terms of the impact on air services generally. Um, and there is a real concern that the, the commitment of already millions of pounds of public money um, to, the, to, to the rolling out of this programme um, is going to be compounded by further investments before there is a, a, a proper sort of due diligence and audit um, conducted on, on this expenditure. And I think we can all draw on examples of, of where that process has led to some fairly uh, 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 unpleasant and regrettable outcomes in, in other areas of, of public expenditure. Um, so again, I, I would hope that the committee would agree that that auditory process um, needs to, to, to kick in um, earlier on rather than simply tell us um, that, um, well, you really didn't want to do that some way down the line when the, when, when the money's already uh, been spent and we're, we're well past the point of no return. So um, I, I, I'm not sure there's much more I can add at, at, at this stage, but as I say, I think certainly in relation to the island's impact assessment, uh, that has exposed um, many of the, the concerns that Rhoda uh, and myself and, and um, former colleague Gail Ross were um, articulating at previous meetings and were shared by um, the, the committee colleagues at, at, at that stage. Uh, and that's something I think that the, 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 the current committee might um, sort of usefully uh, follow up with the, with the Cabinet Secretary and indeed with HIAM. Okay, thank you. So, so can I just ask, you made reference there to, uh, a, was that a survey or a, a late, a, a, is that a new survey? Is this the island impact assessment? Yes. Or is it, it's a provision of the Islands Act. Um, the, the, um, the, the coming into force of the provisions it was slightly delayed. Um, so there was a question as to whether or not um, the, uh, the, the, the proposals were legally um, bound to, um, to be subject to an island impact assessment. But given the nature of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the programme, Hyal undertook this impact assessment, um, at the conclusions of which um, I just I'm sorry, but when was that? Sorry, I it, mean, is that new, or was, or is it, that something the committee it, was previously aware of? They were aware of it taking place. It came in there, right? So yeah. we've seen that. But I just yeah. wasn't sure if that was something completely fresh, but it, we, we are aware it of that. Took the, the, it was delayed in terms of its undertaking. I think some of that may be due to, to, right. to, to COVID, um, quite legitimately. Um, the publication of it was then. I think significantly delayed um, beyond when it was handed to, to Hiles management and, and, and then uh, shared more, more, more publicly. So obviously the, the committee, the predecessor committee didn't have an opportunity as far as I'm aware to, 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 to look at the detail of that in the context of the work that we're doing on this petition. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm, maybe update me on that. <laughs> yeah, um, and invite Rhoda Grant. Um, th thank you, convener, and I won't repeat um, what Liam MacArthur has said because I think your time is short. Um, I suppose the petition is about two things. It's about um, the new air traffic management system, but it's also about the downgrading of Wick and Benbecula, and I think members will have seen in the petitioner's response um, some focus on downgrading of Wick and um, Benbecula to Aerodrome Flight Information Service, and that means that they can only take um, booked, unscheduled flights. Now, WIC is in the process of developing a PSO to encourage um, more traffic through the airport. But it's important to note that in the past, WIC has served as a base um, for North Sea Oil. So it's very difficult to have booked and scheduled flights, especially helicopter traffic that can only land if booked in an emergency from oil rigs and the like. So I don't think WIC is suitable for um, AFIS. And neither is Ben Becula, because Ben Becula is home um, to an MOD range. So we have traffic from all over the world coming in um, to test weapons on that range. Again, having only booked slots available at those two airports makes no sense to me. So I would urge um, the committee to, to look into that and see what impact that's going to have on the local economy, both oil and um, the MODs um, work in, on Benbecula because I'm concerned the Benbecula um, 
facility was under threat from the MOD a few years ago and was almost closed and it was because of um, community intervention that it was kept open. But it's a facility of national importance. And I don't think the MOD have been properly consulted, although I'm having difficulty getting that information out of them. So we need to look at the economic impact. One of the things Hayal are saying is now that they are exploring commuting for existing staff so that they're not forcing people out of work. But my early discussions with Hayal about commuting, they made it clear um, that HMRC would not allow this on a permanent basis. They would allow it as a transition, but not as a, on a permanent basis. So I would suggest the committee look into the feasible ability, apart from obviously personally, that would be difficult for families to be away from home when they go home every night um, just now. Um, so I'd ask the committee to look at that. I'd also ask the committee to have a look at what's maybe happening in Inverness. I understand the, the base, one of the, the um, reasons for this process is, hi, I'll tell us, is recruitment. But actually the place they've had issues with recruitment is Inverness, where they intend to move everyone to. And my understanding is at the moment Inverness um, is suffering staff shortages to the point that the head of air navigation services is actually doing operational shifts to keep that going. So it seems to me crazy to be moving people to Inverness where that is the most difficult place to recruit, the recruitment in the islands. And Hayal were actually really good at this. They recruited local people and trained them up, people who wanted to remain at home. So actually what they had was something that could have been an exemplar for other areas, but because of a problem in one area, they seem to be um, pushing that away. Um, also, Digital Scotland have classed this project as an amber or red risk, and I would urge the committee to make contact with them to find out what their concerns are. I also contacted Audit Scotland, and they told me that um, kind of the annual audit of HIAL was out with their remit, but obviously they have a responsibility for its use of resources. So I wonder also if the committee would contact um, Transport Scotland's auditors who are responsible for the annual audit um, of um, HIAL to uh, and see if that um, if they have any concerns about that because my understanding is it's already delayed, it's already overpriced and it seems to me that this is just another vanity project um, that is going to have a detrimental effect on the very communities that needed to work and needed to work properly and likely um, nobody is saying that something doesn't have to change, we need radar in those airports, we need to make them more sustainable but this is not the way to do it. So I would urge the committee to keep this alive and maybe probe in those areas to see if we can get um, a better understanding of the risks involved. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, having heard from our two colleagues, I wonder whether any, as we now consider what to do next, um, whether any colleagues have got any comments they would like to make. I mean, I'm tempted to, to come to you, David Torrance, simply because you obviously have been long engaged with this petition. So, uh, Thank you for that, <laughs> um, but not if you have a burning, <laughs> a burning ambition for me not to. No, um, I, as somebody who's taken uh, several evidence se sessions on this in uh, session five, I would still like to keep the petition open because there's questions to be asked here, as my two colleagues have uh, mentioned. Um, I wonder if. Um, we could write to the different groups, especially I want to, I would like to write to Civil Aviation Authority just to find out where, how successful this has been in other areas. Um, I know we've been given the guarantees that it is on budget, um, but I would like to see that. Um, and the Highlands and Islands Impact Assessment, I would definitely like to see what that impacts on the local economy and things like that. So I'd, I'd like to find that assessment and see what yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Tess White. I, I see there are two issues here. One is um, employee relations issues in relation to HIAL, and that's for the leadership of HIAL. That's not, not, not for us. They, they've got to transition as, as, as they've been charged to do. However, Rhoda Grant actually does talk about safety issues, so if there are serious safety concerns, they need to be 
looked into as a matter of importance. Just my final point is about the residents. So the residents of the Highlands and Islands are extremely concerned about the uh, reliability of transport links. So as I say, that's a completely separate matter to the employee relations issues uh, at HIAL. And I think in relation to the reli reliability of transport links for the Highland and Islands, which is critical to their economy, um, is that we do follow up with the Scottish Government. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bill Kidd. Yeah. Um, th <clears throat> thank you. A couple of things. One, <clears throat> I think it would be interesting to um, be able to uh, judge where the costs involved in the project um, actually take us. I mean, is it something that's been introduced, the idea of in order to save money and in order to um, provide Hyo with a with a better um, financial uh, position. Um, other than that, uh, and one of the reasons for that, my concern over that is the fact that um, jobs um, locally could potentially be lost, uh, good quality jobs for local people. Um, so I think that's worth having a look at. The other thing is uh, the safety of the system, the remote tower solution, which um, because I'm not technical, I really can't grasp the idea about how this operates over such a large area and its safety of passengers and crew um, and those on the ground, no doubt, um, who I think um, should be brought forward. I think we need more in information on the safety of the remote tower solution. OK, thank you. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks to colleagues for their very enlightening submissions. And in particular, I note that the budget for the project has been approved already by Transport Scotland. So I would like to know if that's just a general provision, uh, whether the, the, the detailed specification is locked in, in terms of whether it's primary or secondary or, or this preferred scheme um, for uh, ADSB, um, whether that's conditional. Um, furthermore, I note an escalation with action by the Prospect Trade Union, most recently a, a strike at the end of July, and perhaps what the latest situation is with the workforce and their representatives, whether they would be willing to make a, a submission in relation to that. Um, I think that those are the key things, really, that would be good to know um, at this point. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I, I'm, I, I think I'm minded to suggest on the basis... David Torrance, you wanted to come back again. Sorry, Convener. Um, I didn't mention earlier on Digital Scotland. I know my colleague, Rhoda Grant, mentioned it about it being an amber or a red project. Can we write to them as well, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, I, I say I think we keep this petition open. I mean, I'm, I am mindful that there clearly has been a very, very extensive consideration of it um, by the previous committee. Um, and that the reality is the Scottish Government supports the, the initiative. Um, they've confirmed it's on budget and they've referred to the review independently through Digital Assurance Office. But even so, I like Mr Torrens, just assertions that it's been successfully deployed elsewhere in the world are things I might just like to probe. Um, and I would quite like the Civil Aviation Authority to be very specific in telling us where it's been tested successfully elsewhere in the world and then for us to see whether that's the case. And to pick up on the various suggestions that I think colleagues made about the writing to the government just to find out the absolute status of the project at the present time. Is everything they've previously said still the case? Um, is it still um, being reviewed uh, and found to be on budget and to specification? Uh, and the issues that I think Mr Sweeney raised as well, I think we could incorporate into that too. Uh, are we are happy to do that? Content? Content? Thank you very much. Our next petition is PE1812, Project Scotland's remaining ancient native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors. Uh, this uh, petition can, carries forward, having previously lodged by Audrey Baird and Fiona Baker on behalf of HELP, trees help us. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to deliver world-leading legislation giving Scotland's remaining fragments of ancient native and semi-native woodlands and woodland floors full legal protection before COP26 uh, in Glasgow in November 21. 
In its submission, the Scottish Government highlights that it is committed to maintaining or exceeding EU environmental standards where appropriate and practical to do so through its environment strategy, vision and outcomes and in legislation through the Continuity Bill. It states that it will bring forward a draft policy statement regarding the use of the discretionary power to align with EU law for consultation early in this parliamentary session. The Scottish Government also intends to produce a new Scottish biodiversity strategy no later than 12 months after the Convention on Biological Diversity's 15th Conference of Parties, COP15, and to increase the area protected for nature in Scotland to at least 30% of land by 2030. In response, the petitioners described the Scottish Government's submission as a catalogue of failure, barely disguised by statements of intention on meaningful action to protect native woodland and stem biodiversity loss in the future. And they argue that most of their petition objectives have been ignored by the Scottish Government. Uh, with that ringing endorsement in our ears, <laughs> can I ask colleagues whether anybody has any comments they would like to make? at this time. I think there's some work still to do. Um, I'd like to keep the petition open. Um, I don't think there's going to meet its aims of having the protection here before COP26 petition, but um, I would like to seek an update from the Scottish Government on its response to independent deer working group, as suggested by the PPC in the last session, um, and see where we are in the biodiversity and the protection of the woodlands. OK. Any other comments? Mr Sweeney. Yes, Chair. Um, I think I, I'd agree that the pl current planning framework isn't necessarily well-defined enough in respect to ancient woodlands and that it could benefit from uh, enhancement as proposed by the petitioners um, to the extent where it is effectively enforced wilderness. Um, and I think that would be beneficial from a policy perspective. Therefore, I think there is a, a legitimate basis to maintain the petition is open. Okay. Thank you for that. On that basis, I think we are inclined to keep the petition open and to seek an update from the Scottish Government on its response to the Deer Working Group, uh, as our predecessor committee suggested. Um, and just that could, uh, I think, I, uh, bring forward some of the issues Mr Sweeney has just raised. Uh, are we agreed? Thank you. Uh, petition 1837, provide clear direction and investment for autism support. Um, lodged originally by Stephen Layton. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Government to clarify how autistic people who do not have a learning disability and or mental disorder can access support and allocate investment for autism support teams in every local authority or health and social care partnership in Scotland. This was last considered in February uh, this year, and at that meeting, uh, the committee agreed to continue the petition, include it in the legacy paper which we have received, along with the suggestion to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport on the various concerns written in the written submission, raised in the written submissions received on the petition. Uh, since the uh, committee last considered the petition, written submissions have been received from Autism Scotland and the Convention of Sco Scottish Local Authorities. And the position has received 23 submissions to date and has been considered twice by the previous committee. The Scottish Government submission of December 2nd, 2020 highlights that support for autistic people is available from a wide range of sources which provide a range of support, including social groups, one-to-one -one counselling and post-diagnostic support. The submission notes that the Scottish Government is working collaboratively with national autism charities and autistic-led organisations to deliver a national autism post-diagnostic support service. The pilot project ran from December 20 until May this year. A national autism implementation team was established in partnership between the Scottish Government and Queen Margaret University to support health and social care partnerships to consider best practice and improve service in the redesigning of autism diagnostic services. It is supporting NHS boards to examine diagnostic pathways for autism and establish regional experts to assist with improving tiered autism specialisms across health boards. In its submission of the 11th of March 21, Scottish Autism welcomes the petition's call for more resources from the Scottish Government at a local level to support Scottish autistic people support autistic people and their families. Scottish Autism believe that there, are, that there continues to be an absence of consistent and accessible support services available in Scotland. 
However, COSLA's submission stated that it currently does not support the call for a blanket approach to providing support teams or ring-fenced funding. This is due to the impact of ring-fenced funding and local authorities' ability to fund non-ring-fenced services. COSLA outlined that services are not provided to autistic people on the basis of the Mental Health Act, rather they are provided following a professional assessment of individual need and eligibility criteria. In their submission, the petitioner highlights that in the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services Rejected Referrals Report, the repeated issue raised was that services are declining to support autism needs on the grounds of this not being a mental health issue. The submission then suggests that if autism is to be considered a mental health disorder, investment from the mental health budget could be used to create autism support teams, which would in turn reduce pressure on mental health and social work services. The petitioner concludes by stating their view that the status quo is not enough and that submissions to this petition made by autistic people and their families demonstrates that more still needs to be done. Uh, that's quite a comprehensive analysis of where we're at. And I again wonder what, uh, whether colleagues would like to contribute as we consider our next steps. This has obviously, I know, been a huge issue. Uh, I can remember colleagues in the last parliament bringing forward debates and speaking regularly on it. And it is an issue about which a number of people feel quite passionately. We have a very specific legacy paper recommendation, which is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care on the issues raised. Um, what do colleagues feel about that proposal? Or is there an alternative course of action they'd like to advocate? David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I think the Scottish Government has made headway, um, but I still think the recommendation from the Public Petitions Committee in Session 5 to bring a Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care in, I think we should do that and just see how much headway they have and how much progress the Scottish Government has made and where does, um, it's been flagged up in the system. Um, there's faults, how we could rectify that. I see nods of approval from colleagues. Are we agreed on that as a course of action? I think we are, and I think, therefore, we would like to follow that through and just have a session where we're able to focus on these issues quite specifically with the Cabinet Secretary for Health. Thank you. That brings us to petition number 1838, the regulation of non-statutory child advocacy services. And I'm delighted that we are being joined for this petition by Christine Graham, MSP. Welcome to you, Christine. This petition is, again, a continued peti continuing petition, uh, originally lodged by Martin Baker and Catherine Bailey. And the petition calls on the Scottish Government to ensure that non-statutory child advocacy services are properly regulated to ensure competence, transparency and accountability. The Session 5 Petitions Committee last considered this petition at its meeting on 10th of March 21. And at that meeting, the committee agreed to continue this petition included in the legacy paper, which we have received, along with a suggestion to write to the relevant minister to seek a response on whether the Scottish Government will undertake the work necessary to introduce legislation to regulate non-statutory child advocacy services. Including its last consideration, the committee has considered this petition twice and has received 14 written submissions. Uh, in her written submission on the 1st of December 2020, the then Minister of Community Safety stated that the regulation of child advocacy services would require a full cons consultation and primary legislation in which the scope for the and efficacy of regulation may be limited as child advocacy services are not only provided by organisations or persons acting in a professional capacity. In the event that regulation was implemented, consideration would be required as to how it is enforced with persons supporting in the capacity of a relative, for example. In response to the limitations of the scope and efficacy of regulation due to non-professional persons carrying out the role, the petitioner questioned whether the definition of services under any legislation could be outlined to cover paid employees or volunteer staff of organisations which offer such services. And again, before proceeding to colleagues, uh, I would ask Christine Graham if she would like to contribute uh, to, in support of the petition. 
Well, thank you very much, convener. And let me just put on the line that I support advocacy services for children. That's not the issue. It's when we have, as you've uh, already illustrated in the petition, it's very narrow, non-statutory child advocacy services in court proceedings to do particularly with contact and residence. Um, I've looked at, if I, I, what you haven't read out, and forgive me if this is something you already know, is I came to this through a case, as many of us do, but it broadened the whole issue. Um, this was the experience, and I'm not going to obviously anonymise it, the devastation caused to the intervention of a child advocacy service in the lives of two of my constituents. The intervention started because of a series of unfounded allegations made against the, the man, but the advocacy service soon became the driver of events that multiplied the allegations without ever investigating their validity. And of course, once you've alienated children, I know this 20 years ago in practice as a family lawyer, it's practically impossible to undo. Now, what's the backing for that? Well, what happened was my constituents went to proof and the sheriff, in her judgment, set out in detail the systematic creation by the Child Advocacy Service of an entirely false narrative in the minds of the children, including practising with them emergency evacuation drills you know, as if the father would attack them, and also refused to recognise its role in perpetuating and amplifying the falsehoods. Now, there may not be that many cases, but one case is one case too many. Now, I note what, um, convener, you've said about the cabinet, uh, it was the minister, I think, Ash Denham's response to this. I look through what you're doing, and I see this reference to the Children's Saving Scotland Act 2011, Children's Advocacy Services Regulations 2020, which came into force in November last year, but it only sets out requirements as to qualifications, training and fees. It does not set out anything requirement to do with regulation. I also note, as you already read out, the um, Minister's response in saying... It would, be, it would be difficult. These primary legislation, I don't care about that. If something needs fixed, primary legislation is neither here nor there. But what it says is, are not only provided by organisations or persons acting in a professional capacity, or quasi-professional capacity, we might say, in the event that regulation was implemented, consideration would be required as to how it's enforced with persons supporting the capacity of a relative. Well, relatives are a completely different species. They are not disinterested parties, and neither should they be in any proceedings regarding children with whom they are connected. What we're looking at is non-statutory advocacy services, which currently are not regulated. And to get to the stage in court proceedings, after the damage that is done in pleadings and court, and it's all written out and everything, and by the way, the constituents didn't see what had been said and only found out by the way, as it were, at the stage of proof, the damage is done. And I think the comments by the sheriff are very telling. Um, I think it's a very, very serious issue. I mean, you raised mesh and how serious that was and how petitions have quite rightly moved us on. I would really like somebody like the Cabinet Secretary to answer to this and to see it's, it's something that can be fixed. It's something that can be fixed. And to say that you can't, you know, relatives cause an issue in doing that, they don't. Services, the constituents have already mentioned services. Well, you never talk about a relative providing services. <laughs> services. So definition is all in this. So um, that's my position uh, on this. Uh, you can see it's heartfelt because I have been two years following this with these constituents. I know the misery it's made of their lives and, in fact, the impacts on their children with whom they have no connection whatsoever now and probably never will have. And I just think that shouldn't happen. Thank you that, that, uh, for that. Um, I, I'll come to colleagues again, having heard from Christine Graham and having read the submissions we've received, if they would like to comment. And I see Tess White would like to come in. Um, may I ask, Christine, in, in your experience, extensive experience, do you see any downsides to what you suggest? Because you've obviously balanced the two, or is, all, is everything, you know, a, 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 an upside or are, are, there, are you mindful of anything that, that has to be taken into consideration? Regulation is in the interest of all non-statutory advocacy services. Any service that's provided non-statutory, I think it, 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 it makes, makes people sure that they're certified in what they do, they're regulated and that, that what they say has weight and value 
and is not, as in this case, um, and I don't think it was deliberate, but it just so happened that a narrative was brought into the children that could never be undone. And alienation, parental alienation, is not a strange thing when spirits and passions are high in relation to contact and residency with children. The, the issue between the parents becomes something that spills over onto the children. shouldn't, but it does. Uh, so I think regulations in the interests of the non... Uh, I, I can't see what the problem is. Um, you know, we all, we're regulated, <laughs> we have to obey rules, and that's just as it should be. And I think the same should happen with these non-statutory advocacy services. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, and thank you to Christine Graham for uh, providing us with uh, depth of background. Um, I find it difficult to actually believe, although it's true, um, that there are non-statutory Child advocacy, child advocacy services. I think that's bizarre, um, and I can't see that any child advocacy service would have any particular logical reason for being against regulation of the services. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I mean, I noticed that. I mean, re referring back to the the Minister for Community Safety at the time, um, Ash Denham, I think. Uh, Christine Graham said, um, it, it would require full consultation of primary legislation. And I take Christine Graham's point. I don't know whether that was meant to be a disincentive to us to pursue the issue or whether that was actually uh, identifying the course of action. Because I, I agree, if, and I think the committee, from what I hear, agree, if primary legislation is what is required because the case is compelling and correct, then that is what would have to follow. Therefore, I think that it would be in the first instance interesting to know whether the current Minister for Community Safety um, is prepared to commit to the Scottish Government undertaking that consultation that would be a precursor to any subsequent legislation uh, in relation to the advocacy or the regulation of non-statutory child services. Are we content with that? I think that would be the first step in the pattern that was identified. And we'll keep the petition open on that basis and see what response we receive. Thank you very much thank and thank you to the committee. Thank you very much. Um, the, petition 1845, the Agency to Advocate for the Healthcare Needs of Rural Scotland. And we are joined again by uh, Emma Harper, MSP. Um, and this is the uh, last of the petitions that we are considering on a continued basis this morning. Uh, and Rhoda Grant, sorry, is uh, speaking to this one as well. So I, my apologies. But we've got, you're both competing with each other this morning to, <laughs> to ensure that you're, you're with us for the same number of petitions, but I'm glad to have both. Um, this was originally lodged by Gordon Baird on behalf of the Galloway Community Hospital Action Group, and the petition calls on the Scottish Government to create an agency to ensure that health boards offer fair and reasonable management of rural and remote healthcare issues. Uh, it was first considered in January this year, and the clerk's note outlines that work that the Session 5 Committee carried out so far. Submissions received highlight some of the issues experienced by rural and remote communities as they try to access medical care. And those include patients being required to take long, often awkward journeys for not only critical care, but also routine outpatient appointments. And I think we've all of us heard examples of that from colleagues uh, in the chamber, uh, various questions. Outreach clinics to rural communities being dependent on individual consultants rather than organised programmes. And a failure by key organisations to understand the importance of dispensing GPs to rural and remote communities. And I'll, I was going to say, I was going to, I'll do it alphabetically. So, uh, Rhoda Grant first. Um, thank, thank you, convener. Um, this petition is not um, from people within um, my constituency, but you'll have seen that um, Caithness Health Action Team also made a submission um, to the committee in support of this petition. And it, their concerns are very, very similar in that they have huge distances to travel um, to access medical treatment. And while there is some funding available, um, it's not adequate to... to meet the, the, dis, the financial disadvantage of this, but also there's a social disadvantage if, if people have caring responsibilities, um, looking after children when they're away, and all of that creates huge problems for people. And 
this is consistent throughout the area I represent, the Highlands and Islands, and has been an ongoing issue, I think, for me in all the time I've been in this parliament. What I understand is that training for, for medics, for nurses, for all those involved in, in healthcare is geared towards teamwork, so people collaborate to work together um, to provide healthcare. And in remote rural areas, we're asking people to work very much on their own without any backup and be dependent on their own skills and knowledge to do that. So the training doesn't equip people for doing that. We also see that the NHS... Um, really value specialisation. So if you specialise in a subject, your grading goes up, and that's true for doctors and nurses. Whereas in the area I cover, and I was speaking to nurses at one point who had a huge range of skills because literally they needed to cope with anything that came through the door, and that was anything that was happening there and then. But we're actually on a basic banding. The, the breadth of their knowledge was not recognised. It would only be the depth of their knowledge that was recognised. So there's a huge disincentive for people who are generalists to become involved, one, from a training point of view, and two, from a financial career progression point of view. So I, I really agree with the petitioners. I think we need an, someone to take this and work with it, an agency that will look at this, look at training, look at remuneration to make sure that we have health services in those remote rural communities because it gets to the point where people aren't maybe getting the health interventions they need as quickly as they can because it becomes very, very difficult for them. So we don't need an a and &E round every corner. What we need is services that provide those kind of services to people without the same in-depth and specialisms elsewhere. They should have the same access to health services, regardless of where you live. Thank you very much. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Thanks again for having me here. Um, thanks to, to the committee for considering this petition. I am aware of this petition. I know Dr Gordon Baird very well, and he has created this petition on behalf of uh, himself from the Galloway Community Hospital Action Group and another retired GP, um, Dr Angela Armstrong. Um, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to create an agency to ensure that health boards offer fair and reasonable management of rural and remote health care issues. The Friesen Galloway is part of my South Scotland region and Stranraer is the town where I was born and lived until moving to the Dufries area when I was 12. I'm very familiar with the rurality of the southwest part of my of, of my constituency, and I often hear from constituents that they feel forgotten, as many people automatically look to places north of the central belt and even the islands when providing examples of remote and rural places in Scotland. I have a couple of examples I would like to share, and uh, um, the convener has touched on one already, but. Uh, the NHS in Friesen Galloway is part of the South East Scotland Cancer Network. This means that people who live in Wigtonshire and Dumfries, Cannonby, Lockerbie, they are included in cancer pathways and treatment plans mean that they sometimes have to go to Edinburgh for some types of cancer care, such as radiotherapy. It's a 266-mile round trip for folk living in Stranraer. Um, my understanding and response from questions raised to the previous Health Secretary about this cancer pathway issue has been that patients in D&G are offered a choice of place to attend as part of their treatment, meaning that if the treatment choice was Glasgow, then that would be the place to attend. But nowhere in Dovries and Galloway is close to Edinburgh by travel time than Glasgow, Beetson, for instance. Um, a second example to highlight regarding fairness is that persons in other health boards, Ayrshire and Arran and Highlands and Islands, are offered travel reimbursement for journeys over 30 miles. This is not the case in D&G, and people are means-tested for any travel costs to be reimbursed. So these are two examples only. I understand that the Scottish National Party's manifesto proposes a centre of excellence for remote and rural health and social care, and I have already had a response from Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf regarding the initial progress of this. 
I welcome the government's introduction of the Scott Gem Scottish Graduate Entry to Medicine programme. That, uh, and we passed the St Andrews Bill in the last session of Parliament. Scott Gem does have a focus of increasing the number of graduate doctors with a rural focus. Um, so I would be grateful to the the petitions committee to progress this petition. I would uh, seek to be proactive and objective and have those proactive objective measures taken forward. Um, we really do need to highlight the health challenges in remote and rural areas and I would welcome the petitions committee uh, to continue to progress this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll ask colleagues on the basis of the evidence we've heard they'd like to thank comment. You. David uh, Johns. Thank you to my colleagues for giving evidence. Um, I'd like to keep the petition open. I think we should write to Remote and Rural General Practice Short Life Working Group, chaired by Sir Lewis Ritchie, and the Rural NHS Board seeking their views on the action called in the petition. But I'd also like to write to the Scottish Government to request an update on the National Centre for Rural Health to see what progress has been made there. Thank you. Um, Paul Sweeney. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think the, the concerns raised by the petitioners are, are incredibly important and um, the, the, the submissions by colleagues today have been really enlightening as well. What I'm curious about is the role of NHS health boards in these areas and how accountable they actually are. I think that's, the, I think that's kind of the elephant in the room here, isn't it? You know, that they're meant to be the, the democratic, if you like, voice of stakeholders within those regions. And clearly, they're not performing that role effectively. If this is the issue that's been a, is, is now rising from organic groups underneath, so I think there needs to be a consideration of actually how effective these health boards are at re representing the interests of their their um, areas. So, uh, should should the petition actually write to these health boards asking um, how they can respond to the concerns raised by the petitioners, how they can redesign their services in accordance with the issues raised by the petitioners. I'd also argue that how transparent are the appointments to these boards? Is there elections to them that are actually well known? You know, should they not be considered as important as local council elections, for example, in terms of actually developing representation? So I think there's an element around that. How democratic are these health boards? How accountable are they? They're quite opaque. Um, so maybe there's something around that. Yep, uh, thank you. David Torrance? No, oh, sorry, you're just waving your no. pen. Yeah, just waving. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, no, I'm happy to support all of those suggestions. And I actually do think the issues raised in this are important. And I would like to write to the health boards and uh, to Sir Lewis Ritchie on the basis that it may well be that it would be useful for us subsequently to take evidence um, on the back of the submissions that we receive and to pursue these issues orally in a little bit more detail as well, because... Uh, I think, in the first instance, I want to hear how they would respond to some of the arguments made in the petition, but I think after that we could drill down a bit further. So we will keep the petition open and we'll proceed on that basis, and I hope that meets with everybody's approval. OK, thank you very much. And that concludes Agenda Item 1. <laughs> You'll be glad there are only two. <laughs> Agenda Item 2 is a consideration of new petitions. And I think it would be useful just for people who might be following proceedings to know that as a standard working practice, the committee, uh, whereas it historically used to meet and then agree to ask the Scottish Government for its views in a petition, now as a matter of course writes to the Scottish Government asking its views on a petition and to some other stakeholders as well, in order that each of the sessions that we have in considering a petition is as informed as possible. Uh, and I wouldn't want anyone following our proceedings or, or any petitioner to think that that necessarily unduly influences the discussion that we subsequently have or the consideration that we subsequently have, but it does allow us to at least have a basic understanding of the reaction of the government to the petition and also of other stakeholders who may have an interest. Uh, the first of our petitions, new petitions this morning, uh, petition 1854, review the adult disability payment eligibility criteria for people with mobility, mobility needs. Um, and this is a petition lodged by Keith Park on behalf of MS Society and calls on the Scottish Government to remove the 20 metre rule from the proposed adult disability payment eligibility criteria or identify an alternative form of support for people with mobility needs. 
Adult Disability Payment, ADP, is due to replace Personal Independence Payment, PIP, in Scotland from the summer of next year, following a pilot in spring next year. And under the principle of safe and secure transition, the Scottish versions of DWP disability and carer benefits will, at least in the short term, have much the same rules as their DWP equivalents. In its submission, the Scottish Government states that it consulted on the draft regulations for adult disability payment between 21st December 2020 and the 15th of March this year. The Scottish Government has advised that it will review the responses to the consultation and, if required, adjust the draft regulations in light of the feedback. The Scottish Government's submission highlights that the DWP has been clear that in order for ADP to be considered a comparable benefit to PIP, ensuring Scottish clients remain entitled to various reserve payments, it must be delivered on a like-for-like -like basis. The submission notes that any changes which widen eligibility risk DWP deciding that ADP is not a comparable benefit to PIP and withdrawing automatic entitlement to reserve payments for Scottish clients. As such, it advises that whilst this period of transition from PIP to ADP is ongoing, it has decided not to make any significant changes to eligibility criteria before ADP is launched. The submission advises that the Scottish Government is focusing on the significant changes it can make to how disabled people in Scotland experience accessing disability assistance, such as providing additional application channels and replacing assessments with person-centred consultations. The Scottish Government is committed to facilitating an independent review of ADP in 2023, one year after delivery has begun, which it believes will enable all of the eligibility criteria to be considered in the round, rather than any changes being made in a piecemeal way. In their submission, the petitioner points to the Scottish Government's consultation and proposals for ADP, highlighting that people with disabilities and organisations working on their behalf identified the need to remove the 20-metre rule in their responses. The submission notes that the Scottish Government's proposals for ADP, it is not argued that the rule is an effective measure, a way to measure mobility. In response to the risk of ADP not being considered a comparable benefit to PIP, the petitioner argues that changing the 20 metre rule to a 50 metre rule would not impact on passported benefits on the basis that an enhanced rate of mobility, compared with the standard rate, does not entitle individuals to any additional DWP benefits. Uh, quite complicated, but uh, quite direct as well. And I wonder, again, whether any colleagues would like to comment as we consider what we might do with this new petition. Um, sorry, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much. Um, uh, no, I just, I think um, we could get in touch uh, right to the Scottish Government to seek an update on the outcome of the consultation um, you know, the consultation is supposed to uh, an independent review of ADP in 2023. Um, so we're away yet, but um, can we get an update on how progress is going just now on that consultation? Um, what sort of what's being considered within that, which may answer some of the issues that we have uh, from the petitioners? Thank you. Uh, David Jones. Thank you. If like Bill could, I would like to um, keep the petition open and um, back up the suggestions that he's made there. But I'd really like to get a legal definition on this, that, that ADP must be delivered on a like-for-like -like basis. Any changes would widen the legible risk to DBT, DWP, deciding that ADP is not a comparable benefit to PIP and withdrawing a matter of entitlement to reserve payments from Scottish clients. I'd really like to get a legal definition. I would like to know if that is definite. Uh, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Chair. I, I would echo that um, challenge uh, to the DWP um, on this matter of like-for-like -like basis. And I think it's also important we test the provisions within the 2016 Scotland Act about where competence lies for devolved benefits and topping up or enhancing existing benefits. I think this is quite an important issue we need to really interrogate. And I think the Parliament merits it should have a duty to explore that thoroughly. Um, I think there's a risk that there's been a, well, it's been a risk-averse approach by the civil service in trying to design this benefit that could end up causing significant harm to people in Scotland that we're trying to, to assist. Fundamentally, 
I mean, my personal view is that the, the entire system of arbitrary tick box exercises for assessing eligibility is absurd and it has no basis in any clinical evidence whatsoever. Um, it's actually quite a bigoted policy against disabled people. Um, so I think um, from that point of view, from designing it from a policy perspective, moving away from it would be, would be um, advantageous from my perspective, but also I think having this kind of idea that, that we have to default to it um, in the Scottish Parliament is not is not reasonable, um, <laughs> and I think we need to really test that issue. I think there's an assumption there that perhaps is having a chilling effect, and this this petition is therefore a valid way of actually using that to interrogate the provisions, and actually has a wider constitutional element to it, where it's actually saying, well, where does the threshold of the 2016 powers a, uh, actually sit, and, and what discretion is there? And I think it's important. We shouldn't really treat people who are probably suffering in quite significant uh, hardship um, to wait 2023 for some sort of um, sort of risk averse approach where we introduce it on a late flight basis and then it's then tested thereafter. I think we need to move more urgently on this. Thank you. Um, we can write to the DWP, can we? Yeah. I mean, at, at the moment. It's the Scottish Government asserting, asserting that the DWP has taken a position. We, we, we don't actually know if that's the case. We don't know whether the DWP would regard a change from 20 metres to 50 metres as violating a like-for-like -like basis significantly as such. I, I, I simply see from the submissions that the Scottish Government suggests that might be the case. Um, I actually think it would be worth testing that uh, because, I, I mean, the petitioner, I think... Um, notes that it you know it doesn't lead to any enhanced level of benefit as such it just makes the access to the benefit uh slightly easier for the people who it's seeking to try and assist so i think we should clarify that point at least in addition to the suggestion that came forward um and i think we 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 maybe see in response to those re representations receive where that takes us and then maybe pursue the pers the discussion after that does that seem reasonable Thank you. Uh, petition number 1865, suspend all surgical mesh and fixation devices. Um, this is a new petition lodged by Rosanna Clarkin, Lauren McDougall and Graham Robertson. And the petition calls on the Scottish Government to suspend the use of all surgical mesh and fixation dis devices, while a review of all surgical procedures which use polyester, polypropylene or titanium is carried out and guidelines for the surgical use of mesh are established. In his submission, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care stresses the seriousness with which the Scottish Government takes all issues relating to mesh. He outlines the actions that the Scottish Government has taken in relation to the use of transvaginal mesh for the treatment of stress, urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse, uh, about which obviously we discussed earlier in the first petition this, this morning. He also highlights the high vigilance scruti scrutiny protocol, which was introduced for some other procedures, including abdominally inserted mesh for pelvic organ prolapse. The Cabinet Secretary also highlights research commissioned by the Scottish Government into the use of mesh in indubitable hernia repair, which concluded that mesh resulted in lower rates of recurrence, fewer serious adverse events, and similar or lower risk of chronic pain than non-mesh procedures. As a result, the Cabinet Secretary does not believe that there is evidence to justify a pause in the use of relevant devices. Now, in response, the petitioner highlights the many personal testimonies that have been shared with the committee detailing the life-changing effects of having mesh procedures. The submissions suggest that not all patients have been given sufficient information to be able to give fully informed consent. Neither does it seem that all surgeons are clear about when it is appropriate to use mesh. And since the publication of our papers, we've received two additional submissions from the petitioner. The first details key questions that the petitioner is seeking answers to, and the second highlights the importance of the Cumberledge Review and asks why more progress has not been made in delivering on its recommendations, which I believe the Scottish Government accepted in full from memory in response in the Chamber. Uh, and I think it, it important also to emphasise, uh, for those who followed mesh procedures historically, that this is all mesh procedures uh, across both men and women, and indeed children, uh, and distinct from the petition we considered previously, which related very much to issues affecting uh, exclusively women's health. 
Uh, this is a new petition, an important petition, and I wonder whether any colleagues have any proposals we might consider. Tess White. I'd, I'd like to suggest that we do write to the Cabinet Secretary and ask for further information. When I read this petition, I, 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 I empathise and I sympathise, and it's, um, it's uh, very upsetting to see what some people are having to go through. OK. I mean, I am struck by the response from the Cabinet Secretary that says fewer serious adverse events uh, or low, and lower risk of chronic pain than non-mesh procedures it was exactly the same <laughs> testimony that I think we received in relation to the original mesh petition at the first thing of hear point of hearing. You know, that until people knew that there was an issue to speak out about, it was not something that was much in the public domain. Uh, David Torrance? I'm wondering, um, convener, if we just ask the Cabinet Secretary to come before us and we could ask questions and to give evidence to us, rather than write. Thoughts from others? Uh, Paul Sweeney. Yeah, I think um, certainly from constituents that have um, contacted me, there is a wider issue that's definitely there that merits investigation. Um, the use of these products um, and the potential defects um, that result in significant chronic pain uh, and other um, medical con complications isn't well understood, but there's clearly a significant level of anecdotal evidence that merits f formal investigation. And I don't think there's been sufficient effort put in so far to achieve that. So I definitely think it's a, a worthwhile petition and that the provisions for initiating sort of inquiry are, 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 are reasonable, such as in initiating it with the Cabinet Secretary in the first instance and, and, ask, and inviting them to, to indicate how they will proceed um, with a formal investigation. I think that's a reasonable way forward. Got that meet with, I think we are. I think we are inclined to seek that request, and I think we might say that we would also like to raise um, progress on the Cumberledge review uh, and the recommendations that were made in that in relation to mesh. Uh, at the same time as we're pursuing these fresh issues as well, and I think that would be great. Thank you. Uh, petition one eight six six to introduce legislation to improve bus, bus sorry bus travel for wheelchair users, uh, and this uh, has been uh, lodged by Daryl Cooper. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to introduce legislation so that wheelchair users are able to face frontwards when travelling on a bus. The Scottish Government explains that legislation governing bus travel for wheelchair users is reserved to Westminster, specifically the Public Sector Vehicles Accessibility Regulations, PSVAR 2000. The submission highlights that as part of its recently published national bus strategy, Bus Back Better, the UK Government committed to complete a review of the PSVAR, uh, Public Sector Vehicles Accessibility Regulations, by the end of 2023. The review is expected to be wide-ranging and consider the extent to which the regulations are currently effective in supporting access to respective services and how they could be improved in the future. In response, the petitioner highlights that the regulations are in place to enable disabled people to travel safely and in comfort. He argues that being forced to travel in a rear-facing space may not be comfortable for disabled people and that it should not be for bus operators to choose whether wheelchair spaces should be rear-facing. Colleagues, members who would like to comment, David Torrance. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think we have to close this petition understanding and Rule 15.7 of standing orders, considering it is reserved to Westminster. But in doing so, I would ask a committee right to the petitioner to ask them to engage in the forthcoming review that's been taken by the UK Government in 2023. Okay, thank you. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Chair. I would um, resist um, closing this petition. Um, I, although initially prima facie it seems to be reserved, I think there are significant provisions which are in fact devolved, particularly in terms of the 2019 Transport Act. So, for example, there are provisions within the 2019 Transport Act that can in, uh, establish bus partnerships, which are probably the weakest provisions of regulation over a, a purely laissez-faire system. There are um, also franchising provisions, and as well as direct public ownership. 
Um, so I think within that context, there is significant regulatory capacity within the Scottish Government when defining, for example, a bus franchise to insist that certain provisions of service standards are achieved that don't aren't dependent necessarily on legislation, they're simply dependent on how well designed a franchise agreement is. Um, pr furthermore, I think there are significant financial incentives, for example, around 45% of all bus company turnover in Scotland is public money, subsidy. Therefore, there could be provisions or conditionality attached to that public subsidy, which is from the Scottish Government, for example, for the procurement of new vehicles that specify a certain quality of specification of those vehicles to provide that capability within the service. So I think like for, on those basis, on those factors alone, I think there is significant provision for the Scottish Parliament as a legislature to design a better service standard that meets the petitioner's concerns. Relating to reserve powers. Furthermore, I think there is capacity within this this petition committee to engage with the Scottish Office and to ask what efforts they might be able to make in mending legislation uh, at Westminster that might help back that up. So I think there is a, a significant breadth of breadth of opportunity for us to pursue this. I certainly have long memories of the seat belts in uh, school buses <laughs> petition. Uh, which eventually, I seem to remember, led to the Minister, Mike Penning, agreeing to devolve uh, competencies to the Scottish Parliament. I don't know whether that ever actually happened in the final analysis or not, but it, it did actually uh, some time ago. Uh, David Torrance, having heard from Paul Sweeney, would you be content for us to explore some of these issues further with, yes, the, with, the, with the Scottish Government? Yes. I, I'm very happy to do that and to keep the petition open on that basis. Thank you very much, Mr. Are we, are we all agreed with that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, PE 1867, uh, to establish a new national qualification for British Sign Language. The, uh, this is a new petition, and it's been lodged by Scott Macmillan. And the petition calls on the Scottish Government to encourage the Scottish Qualifications Authority, who I will refer to as the SQA, to establish a national qualification in British Sign Language, which I will refer to as BSL, um, at Scottish uh, SCQF Level 2. The petitioner is calling for the new qualification so that BSL can be eligible to be an L2 language, which would allow it to be taught from primary one. In our submission, the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills explains the establishment of new qualifications is a matter for the SQA. She highlights, however, that children must be able to study an L2 language at secondary school to the level of a national qualification. There are currently no national qualifications in place for BSL. Therefore, as matters stand, even with the creation of a national qualification in British Sign Language at SCQF Level 2, BSL would still not be eligible to be an L2 language, which is definitely a chicken and an egg. <laughs> I've, I heard the definition of same. And I wonder what uh, thoughts colleagues might, uh, members might have in response to that. This new petition. Bill Kidd. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Can we write to the SQA to invite their comments on the proposal? Um, personally, uh, I think that the significant numbers of um, my constituents and everyone's um, who do use BSL um, on a regular basis, including people who they use it as part of their occupation, um, some of whom are signers. Um, I think they deserve the opportunity uh, to be recognised in this manner. Thank you very much. I mean, I, my own sympathies would be very much in support of that proposal. Uh, we have regularly in Parliament had uh, people, uh, organisations who have come to us and, uh, and done their best to uh, actually educate and train MSPs in the use of uh, sign language. Um, and I remember thinking even then that it would have been quite useful if there was a, you know, a professional qualification, a, a, an educational qualification that could be pursued in that regard. So I think uh, let's go and see whether in the first instance the SQA can explain to us um, whether this could be introduced, what would be required in introducing it and what they see as the obstacles to our, you know, to that proposal being progressed. Uh, and the first instance we'll consider the petition afresh. And that brings us to our final new petition this morning, uh, which is petition number 1868, Support for single Working Single Parents, 
uh, lodged by Laura McCain. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Government to provide support to single parents by increasing the council tax discount available to single parents from 25% to 50% and lobbying the UK Government to create a working single parent tax allowance and a household income-based child benefit. In its submission, the Scottish Government highlights its commitment to reforming council tax. It also highlights measures that it has in place to support low-income households, including council tax reduction scheme, which provides relief to just under half a million low-income households, the Scottish child payment, which pays £40 per week per eligible child. The Scottish Government has also committed to extending the eligibility to under-16s by the end of 2022. The Scottish Government argues that this payment, alongside the Best Start grant and Best Start Foods, could provide over £5,300 of financial support to, fi to families by the time their first child turns six years of age. And I wonder, having had a chance to consider the submissions, uh, what suggestions uh, members might have as to how we would proceed. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's quite complicated because there, there appears to be, uh, you know, quite a, a determined uh, course of action in place by the Scottish Government at the present time. They have committed to extending eligibility. Uh, they obviously don't have the competence to intervene in real matters relating to uh, UK income tax, um, unless and if they are beyond the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament, and they've indicated that they are supporting half a million uh, low-income households. Uh, so important as the issue is, I'm not immediately clear what further course of action lies open to us, having now sought and obtained the views of the Scottish Government. Uh, and I, I don't know if other colleagues are minded to close the petition on that basis, um, or whether you feel there's some further avenue we could possibly explore. Kavina, David Torrens. Thank you, Kavina. I would agree with you. I think it's very difficult to explore any other avenue. So um, under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders, I'm happy to close the petition. I, I don't think we do it with any no, great pleasure. No, but, I, I mean, I think our options are limited. And if the committee is agreed, then I think that's the course of action we follow. Um, thank you all very much for your contributions this morning. Thank you to our colleagues who joined us, and um, I now close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>